What's up, everybody? Welcome back. Corey Hughes, Bloody History. So, it is, uh, what day is today? 22nd of January? Yes. Uh, it's the end of the month, um, and I need to sell some books. I need to sell some posters. So, if you are interested in any of these things, please go to buymeacoffee.com slash jfkbook. Pick up a poster, a limited edition of 100 poster signed by me. Pick up a, a copy of the ebook or my notes, and... Um, yeah, so because I'd like to eat for the next couple of days, it'd be really nice. So, but today what we're going to do is we're going to continue on with the theme of New Orleans, and we're going to go and talk about Thomas Edward Beckham a little bit. Um, this will take a couple of days. It's, a, it's quite long. It's 162 pages, but it's it, it's relevant in as far as Beckham was one of these low level guys who knew Oswald, knew the real Oswald, knew Thornley, knew all these guys surrounding David Ferry, and. Therefore, he is extremely relevant because he was in the mix. Uh, he was definitely in Dallas on November 22nd, 1963, where he is captured in a photograph with Kennedy at the airport. <clears throat> so that's in my notes. If you haven't seen my notes, you can pick them up at buymeacoffee.com slash JFK book. Uh, it's a great companion to the book itself. And it actually comes with a copy of the ebook if you haven't bought that yet. Um, but, uh, Beckham's an, an interesting guy, low-level CIA. Uh, he ends up running one of these um, one-man churches under the name of Mark Evans. And uh, he's an associate of Arcacha and of Lawrence Howard and these guys. And and so, yeah, I think we'll spend the next week or two on Beckham, just because he ties into New Orleans. And we will see if he drops any uh, gems in as far as his relationship with Thornley. Because remember... <clears throat> Thornley seems to be the superstar down in fucking New Orleans. Thornley is the one connected to all the CIA handlers like Clint Bolton and Kent Courtney and Martin McAuliffe and all these fucking guys, right? So it seems like there's a lot of effort going into Thornley between the time he shows up there in allegedly February of 61 and the assassination. And so David Ferry's role is obvious and... Clay Shaw's role is obvious, and Thornley's role might not be as obvious, right? And so, going into this testimony of Beckham uh, at this at the Clay Shaw grand jury, uh, it might give us a little some nuggets that might have to do with Kerry Thornley, which is really what I'm interested in. Um, I will preface this by also saying that ten years later, give or take, when Beckham talks to the HSCA, he completely changes his story. And I will try to locate the HSC, HSCA testimony of Beckham um, for when we finish this. Um, today's Monday. We'll, we'll get through this this week. I'll knock this out this week. And then next week we'll get to his HSCA testimony, which is quite different. He basically admits his involvement in the assassination in his HSCA testimony. So let us begin. Orleans Parish Grand Jury, February 15th, 1968, Special Investigation. Present are Mr. Jim Garrison, District Attorney, uh, Messrs. Richard Burns, uh, James Alcock, Alvin Oser, Numa Bertel, and Andrew Scambra, Assistant District Attorneys, and members of the Orleans Parish Grand Jury. All right. Thomas Edward Beckham, after being duly sworn by the foreman of the Orleans Parish Grand Jury, was questioned and answered as follows. It appears as though the questioning is being done by Mr. Alcock. So the questions will be Mr. Alcock and the answers will be Mr. Beckham. Mr. Beckham, let me explain to you fully and completely your constitutional rights. And if you have any questions, I have none. You've already made that clear. Oh, yes, you have constitutional rights, as the court has informed you. You have a right to not answer any question that you feel would incriminate you or even tend to incriminate you in the commission of any crime or the attempt to commit any crime under both the state constitution and the constitution of the United States. Now, if questions should be profound, propounded to you that you feel would incriminate you, then simply say I refuse to answer that on the grounds that an answer to that question might incriminate me. That does not mean that you are automatically held in contempt. Uh, we would then go out in open court and have a foreman address you in open court, and the judge would decide whether or not the answer would incriminate you or intend to, incri or to incriminate you. He already told me about it. I would have to answer it or he would hold me in contempt. No, he did not say that. He said he would decide whether or not it was incriminatory, and if it wasn't you, 
uh, would have had to answer it, and if you persisted in not answering, then you would have been held in contempt. However, if he decided that it could possibly incriminate you, even remotely, then you would not have to answer the question, and we would be prohibited from asking you that question. Do you understand? May I ask a question? Sure. How many men from the district attorney's office are in here today? Is there anybody here besides the district attorney's office? The men seated around the table are the grand jury, and the men from the district attorney's office are one, two, three, four. Sir, if I have anything to say against Mr. Garrison, can these men charge me with anything afterwards? Mr. Garrison will be here himself. Let me say this is part of your constitutional rights, but let me advise you that you have just taken an oath, and you have to tell the truth. But what will you all do to me later? Because you know what I got, and what will you all do to me later? I don't know what you got. Frankly, I don't care what you got. That's why you shook my brother up on Canal Street and threw him against the wall, right there in front of the newspaper stand, and shoved him or and showed him their credentials from the district attorney's office, huh? If you can identify some people who did that, we would be glad to take some action against it. But let me continue with your rights and your duties and responsibilities under the oath. You're bound to tell the truth, the whole truth, and you cannot willfully tell a lie. Additionally, you cannot make a statement categorically to the effect that something is true, but you are not completely sure it is true. I will give you an example. You have seen my car, and I ask you, what is the color? And you say white. You do not know the color, but you say white. Even though my car is white, you would still be guilty of the crime of perjury. Do you understand that? In other words, if you don't understand a question or don't know the answer, or are not sure you know the answer, just say, I don't know. Do you understand that? You all know that if I testify before you today, they will have a charge and arrest me afterwards. If not today, then later on. The juror then says, Mr. Beckham, we are members of the grand jury and we are going to listen to your story. He says, I'm talking about members of the district attorney's office. Mr. Alcock says, Mr. many people have come in here and made statements which were not pleasant about the district attorney or the district attorney's office and none of them have been charged. Why should you be any exception? Mr. Garrison just has questions he wants to ask you, and if you answer the questions truthfully, you have nothing to worry about. Now, do you understand your constitutional rights? I suppose uh, to have them, but I don't think I will. I will be honest with you. Juror says somebody must have told you that. Yes, sir, I know the judge. The judge will go along with Mr. Alcock. Not unless you have proof to back that up. Ma'am, if I leave here and stand on the Fifth Amendment, I will be took out and the judge will tell me to answer the questions and I will have no more Fifth Amendment. Mr. Alcock says, yes, you do. He will tell you to answer the question if it doesn't incriminate you. Obviously, you can't roam in here and refuse to say where you live. That can't harm you, can it? No. That's what are we were talking about. Uh, now, do you understand your constitutional rights? Yes. Do you have any questions before we start? Uh, either of the jury or of members of the district attorney's office? No. Now, for the record, please give us your full name. Thomas Edward Beckham. Where do you live, Mr. Beckham? Visiting here or where I live? Where you live? 5214 North 48th Street. What city and state? Omaha, Nebraska. How long have you lived there, Mr. Beckham? About two and a half years. What is your occupation? I'm a psychologist. Are you a graduate psychologist? Now, when you speak of a graduate psychologist, what are you talking about? I hold a, uh, I'm also a staff officer in the U.S. Merchant Marines. Did you go to college? Yes, sir. Where? And then something is redacted here. How long did you go to college? I received a certain amount of credit there, and I have eight months there. I passed a board of examinations. And where did you go to school prior to that? A long time before that, I lived in New Orleans. Uh, I went to Allen, I think it was H.W. or Henry, something like that. How do you make your living now? I know you're a singer and entertainer. I practice, I practice clinical psychology and industrial psychology. Don't you also have an avocation of singing? That was a long time ago, yes. You are not singing now. Yes, I am, now and then. Oh, shit. Here we go with the CIA bullshit answers. Okay. So you don't have, uh, don't you also have an avocation of singing? That was a long time ago, yes. Are you not singing now? Yes, I am, now and then. So it was a long time ago, but yes, he is still singing now. You see how these people just give you an answer that is handles both sides of the coin. Like, fuck these people. Under what stage name? Mark Evans. 
Where are your offices and where do you work from? It's an office building in Home Together, 5214 North 48th Street. Do you work for any particular firm? I'm self-employed. Where were you born? Enid, Oklahoma. When did you first come to New Orleans? I don't know. Born in Oklahoma and mostly reared in Louisiana. In New Orleans? Right. Did you go to high school there? No, I never. Uh, where did you go to high school? American schools. I left, I think it was at 14 or 15. I went to work for WTPS, owned by the Times Picayune. States and I moved away and I didn't have the opportunity to finish school. And I attend uh, college correspondence schools. Do you have any brothers? Yes, four. What are their names? Oh, it looks like a whole page is redacted or not missing or something inserted. Then it picks up uh, Orville, Monroe, William Henry, Frederick Steve, and James Joseph. All residents of this city? No. Which ones are residents of New Orleans? All except Orville. Do your parents live here in New Orleans? They live in Metairie, Jefferson Parish. At what address? Do I have to give you their address? They have their phone changed. I can't stand on the 5th on that. If you want, but what is incriminatory about giving the address of your parents? I don't want anybody from your office to go out there, out to their home. Now, let me say this is a practical matter. If we really wanted to go out to their home, which we don't, we could find out where they live. They have probably been living there for some time. No, they have moved to get out of New Orleans. The juror asks, don't you know the district attorney could get that address if they wanted? 501 Montgomery. Avenue or street? I don't know. It's near Airline Park. Now, when were you last in the city of New Orleans, approximately, prior coming down in answer to the subpoena? I don't really know. You don't remember? Maybe four or five years ago, maybe longer than that. Notice the selective memory that we keep seeing over and over and over again with these CIA guys. You said something about your going to Omaha some two and a half years ago. Prior to that, I went to Washington. I was a psychologist for the Professional Research Bureau. I say psychologist, I was a criminologist there. It was the National Institute of Criminology with Dr. F. Lee Chrisman. He holds a secondary teaching certificate in the state of Washington. This was in Olympia, the state capitol building. Okay. <laughs> Dr. F. Lee Chrisman, CIA handler extraordinaire. Okay. The guy's not a fucking doctor of anything. <clears throat> Washington State? Yes. You recall when you were there? What year? A good two years now. Well, you were here in 1963, is that correct? That the time the president was killed in 1963? Yes. My mother was living on Chef Monteur Highway. I think you called it Hollywood Trailer Park, something like that. You living at that location then? No, I was living in Mississippi then, but I came in town because mother had the television on. When it happened, and I went back there, and she said, the president is dead. That's bullshit, because he was in Dallas. Prior to that, say the summer of 63 and the spring of 63, were you in New Orleans? Seems like it uh, was forever ago, but I'm pretty sure I was... Seems like it was forever, though. Do you recall being in New Orleans in June of 63? It might have been. Uh, you can check and find out. I don't know. You don't recall? No. Where were you living in Mississippi? I was staying up there in a place called the Carrymore... A motel. It's on Highway 80. I was playing at a club called The Satellite, a place owned by James Norton. What town is it near? Jackson. You were coming into New Orleans off and on to see your parents? Yes. Were you with a band or were you by yourself or what? I toured all over Louisiana. With a band or by yourself? With a band and by myself. Billy Coward was one of the guys that worked in the band and we had two or three different bands, and they would leave the band that I would have to hire somebody else, and we had a half a dozen bands that we would call on. We played all over Mississippi and New Orleans, Louisiana, uh, Faraday, Vicksburg, Hattiesburg, Brookhaven. Where did you first meet Dr. F. Lee Chrisman? In Washington State. Do you recall approximately when this was? Was it before or after the assassination? This was after the assassination. You don't recall when? No. As much as a year after the assassination? This was around 64 or 1965. You met him in connection with your schooling or something. Right. He had an association called American Association of Parapsychologists. Kind of a way out thing. Uh, a belief of life beyond the grave. They go into metaphysics and that sort of thing. Did you study there? No, Dr. Chrisman 
had this association. And meantime, I was associated with the National Institute of Criminology, which we had courses in penology, criminology, and stuff. So I came in contact with Dr. Chrisman through some people there. And he was working his American Association of Parapsychologists as we incorporated a deal in the state of Washington known as the Professional Research Bureau, which handled advertising, industrial psychology, and at the same time we incorporated this National Institute of Criminology. You and Dr. Chrisman. Right, he and I. Anybody else involved in the corporation? No, I think we had someone else to incorporate it. Uh, You had to have so many, but it was a deadhead, just a figurehead. I think they needed seven or something in that state. I forget what it was. Now, how long did you stay out there in Washington with Dr. Chrisman? I was out there pretty near two years because after that, well, things were slow with the Professional Research Bureau and we took on a road show. Went on the road. That is how we happened to be in Dallas in 66 and we stayed at a place called the Executive Motel or Hotel, something like that. You said a road show. You mean a musical road show? Right, right. Went out with uh, broken records is what it amounts to. And the kind of book shows and everything. And Fred wanted to go to Dallas because he's a teacher. And he said he wanted to go and see the place where the president was assassinated. When you refer to Fred, you're talking about Dr. Chrisman. Yes. So we went out to the building with a sign on top and saw it. Then did you continue your association with Dr. Chrisman? Yes. Then I moved away. We closed up. Things were going bad and there was no money to be made. So I left and moved to Lincoln first from there to Omaha. And then I've been there ever since. This was about two years. I think I was last time seen Freddie was here or he was in it was in Lincoln or Omaha because I had it was Omaha because I had brought this Dr. Strange, this guy who was on the Art Linkletter show to Omaha. And we had a convention for five days, a phenomena convention, stuff like that. That is the last time you saw him, right? Right. When was that? Do you remember? I'd have to check on that. It wasn't too long ago because, uh, was it 67 sometime? Yes, it's 67, right? There was a big auditorium there in a store. Last time I saw him, I talked to him on the telephone and stuff. In Omaha? Yes, I talked to him on several occasions. Does he still live out on the West Coast? Yes, he lives, well, I'd say he still lives in there. I always reached him at 928 North Grant Street. By telephone, you spoke to him? Yes, his number is, uh, it's under his mother's name, W.D. White. His mother remarried. His father passed away or something. And he lives with his mother because she had both legs amputated. I think Fred owns the house and his mother and her ex-husband lives there or something. I forget. His stepfather? Right. Is the number MA74790 or MA7-6330? Ooh, let me screenshot that because I'm going to... I have my guys look into these numbers. No, MA7-4893. I know one is his mother's number. And one is his own number. I don't know which one is which. If I call on one and it doesn't answer, I call the other one. When was the last time you communicated with Dr. Christman? I can't remember. Recently? Last week? Two weeks? Three weeks? I don't know. Maybe within that time, within the last two or three months, I called him on the telephone and I said, holy smoke. I told him we were in Dallas of 66 and he said, what do you mean? I said, Mr. Garrison now has got me for a deal and he's got to laughing and said, well, he's going to get everybody before it's over with, you know, laughing and said, well, he sent a subpoena to me. It's coming to me. It hasn't gotten here yet. I called him from my office and he said, what do you mean you told him we were in Dallas? And I said, there is no use in lying about it. I told them we went to Dallas and were at the executive hotel and they will probably contact you. And I said, if they subpoenaed me, they surely will subpoena you. You told us you were in Dallas in 66. You did not say 63. No, I wasn't in Dallas in 63. You you did not tell Chrisman that you were in Dallas in 63, right? Say that again slow. You told us that you were in Dallas in 66. You did not tell Chrisman that you told us you were in Dallas in 63, did you? First, I called Fred and I spoke to his mother. And she said he was not there. I will tell you exactly how it happened. And I said, I want to get a hold of him. She said, that is the matter. You sound all excited. And I said, that fool Garrison sent me a subpoena. She said, you're kidding. I said, no, I am serious. I'm going to send you a newspaper copy. It's in the newspaper and I'm not joking. So I called Fred back about a quarter of five and I got him and he said, what's happening? I said, boy, you, I wish I'd never went to Dallas with you. You and your bright idea starting to Dallas. I was in Houston. You see, he said, let's drive on down to Dallas. And I said, why? And he said, I want to tell my boy 
he and his wife were separated, and he just had to tell his boy, you see, he's interested in things like this, art museums, old books and stuff, and I didn't care to see it. To me, it was just a building, so he wanted to go and see it while we were down there. As a matter of fact, we rented a car from Houston to Dallas to go see it. Then Dad and Mom were living in Texas City, so we drove from Dallas to Texas from Dallas to Texas City, and I saw her and went to Louisiana or someplace. I'm not sure, but that was it. I told the newspaper men we were there in 1966. To your knowledge, do you know whether Clay Shaw knows Mr. Christman? No, I used to talk about that. I got a state police commission and attorney general's commission and all this other baloney they handed out, and I got him a couple of commissions, you know, jokingly. Fred didn't know anybody. You know, we were down here one time during this 1966, and we went to New Orleans, Louisiana, part of Texas, uh, Mr. Beckham, you have not answered the question. I know. I don't know. Since that telephone call, have you had further occasion to communicate with Dr. Chrisman? Oh, yes. I wrote him last. Have you telephoned him or anything like that? No. Every time he writes a research paper or something, he sends me a copy. He kids with me the fact that I know correct English, and he kids me and sends me pieces of paper with correct English, and he is always putting stuff in the mail like that. I can always expect stuff like that. In any of this correspondence, did he allude or refer to the subpoena after you phoned him? I really don't know. You don't recall? I think one or two times he asked me when I was going to New Orleans, and then he said, well, I guess that clown is going to subpoena me next. To get back to the year of 1963, the summer of 1963, when did you first meet David Ferry? I don't know. I know I met the man. Can you tell us the occasion or how it came about? I knew a guy by the name of Roswell Thompson. Guys, let's pull everything on Roswell Thompson. Uh, that's the guy outside. He drove for the pilots. You know they have calls. They have a man on 24-hour day call. My dad was a chief steward at the time. He was on a ship called Chemical Transport. Well, Roz used to drive, pick him up, and bring him back. First time I met Roz, I was 14 years old. Well, Roswell took me from there to... He had a Louisiana kingfish painted on a white card. He was running for governor or something. Well, Roz introduced me to different people, and it excited me. So I met Jack Martin for the first time, and I met another man by the name of Joseph Newbro. And Martin used to take me places with him everywhere he would go. Then in the, uh, I was 17 years old, then Martin wanted to manage me as an entertainer, and he wanted my dad to put up the money. Big deal. So he told him he had connections and on some stationery he had J.S. Martin Publications or something like that. There was an attorney in town by the name of Grady C. Durham. Well, Martin and Durham were personal friends. Martin and dad to put up a lot of money to promote records and Martin tells dad that Grady Durham was in some trouble and he left town, which he did. He disappeared. Then Martin calls dad and sends him a telegram saying we need more money to promote this. So dad kept sending money and finally <clears throat> went to family finance and borrowed money and dad kept putting money up for Martin. You know, Grady Durham is gone then. He's out of the picture. So Jack said, well, it's tough. Grady has flown the coop and the FBI is looking for him. And why dad went along with him was Grady Durham and Jimmy Davis were cousins. And what he said to my dad, and this is how the connections would come in. So after I... After that, I started following Jack around. We made a bunch of records and the money disappeared. So then Jack took me around and introduced me to different people, to private detectives and stuff like that, friends of his. So then I met Mr. Bannister, Guy Bannister. I think he had a place in the French Quarter. And Jack carried information back and forth for him. We carried files. I used to tag along and then Jack, ha he asked me, did I want to go with him? And the only reason he took me, I was, so, I was always there for lunch or car fare or something. So Jack went up to G. Ray Gill's office. As a matter of fact, if I ever got in trouble, Jack would always get an attorney and my dad would send $2,000 or $3,000 to a bondsman and an attorney. Like when I got in trouble with that girl, Jack was the first one there. Jack was the one we paid off to. So anyway, one day Jack went up to Gill's office. He's an attorney here. And Mr. Gill took him and said, Jack, I would like to introduce you to someone who just walked in the office. And I went in and Jack said, I got to deliver some papers to Ferry. And he said, have a seat. See, he wouldn't let me stay around while they were talking. Well, Ferry come out and looked like he had a lot of stuff stuck on his head for hair and phony eyelashes. Funny looking. And he was there for five minutes and he said, this is Tom Beckham. Maybe you've heard me talk about him. That's what he said. 
So he had, uh, so he said, sit down. And Jack went in for about five minutes later. He came out and this guy, Ferry or Ferris, that's the same man. Anyway, he said, Tom, nice to meet you and left. I said to Jack, what did you say that guy did? He said, uh, it's a brilliant man. And he's a private investigator and he's a pilot. And I said, how does this get any clients? How does he get any clients looking like that? So Jack says he was hurt in an explosion or something. The explosion blew him up or something like that. So I said he could buy a wig if he wanted to, uh, but Jack said he don't. It looked like some kind of uh, stuff stuck up there. It wasn't hair, but something else. That's how many, 10 minutes. And then so Jack joined us for a period of time and I associated with Mr. Bannister and stuff. The one day I was mad at Jack and Mr. Bannister had moved to his offices. I don't know if it was Lafayette or Camp or something like that. Well, here was a street here and here was the post office, a back street, a park here. Then a street come in here. You could stand at this post office and see Mr. Bannister's office. Uh, Mr. Bannister... I said, I am mad that Jack, if he ain't a racketeer, he would take me for every cotton picking money he could get. He would ever, he, uh, he would get mad like you would say, I need $5 and I'll give it back. And he would embarrass you, see, right in public. So instead of being embarrassed, I would say, okay, Jack, what the heck? And he got me this attorney general's commission, this crazy little piece of card. So I, anyway, he, here it is. The only reason I keep it is because it got my federal communications on the back. I glued it. Juror asks, what year was this? What year did you meet Ferry? He says, I don't know. Mr. Alcock asks, is that the only occasion you had to see that man? Yes, I never saw him before. In other words, around that time, you were 17 years old and you are 25 now. So it was in 1960, right? Yes, uh, it had to be that, 17 or 18. I don't know exactly because it wasn't long after that. The records maybe at most a year. Was it close to the time you received this thing from Gramillion? I don't know if I received that first or after. I don't know. Jack got that for me. Okay, so let me just pause right here. So right here, we just confirmed that Beckham's relationship with Jack Martin and Guy Bannister and uh, David Ferry all goes back to 1960. Okay, so Beckham, long-standing relationships with these guys by the time of the assassination, at least three years. Okay. <clears throat> What is this reverend? I am ordained now by the Calvary Christian Church of Faith. Christian Church Movement. The first thing, when I was subpoenaed by Mr. Garrison's office, the first thing the news service said when they called me was they said, are you the same Thomas Beckham, the same man the DA Garrison's office has subpoenaed? The one they claimed knew David Ferry and is a priest in the old apostolic church. That's the first thing they said. The old apostolic church. The church didn't dawn on me then because I had forgotten about that church. So I said, I don't know what you're talking about. And I evaded the issue. I even said, this is a friend of his. Uh, the man is not in. Anyway, that was the first thing that brought, brought to my attention was about this stuff in the church. And I had forgotten about it. See the selective fucking memory of these fucking assholes. Oh, I just forgot. Who forgets so much shit? Anyway, Jack, one day we went up to Bannister's and he had moved to this new office. He had a big area. You walked down to get his office on the side. So Bannister had me run next door and there was a bar there. You could get sandwiches and stuff. And he sent Jack and Jack cussed him out for using his typewriter, you see, for not being able to use the typewriter. So Mr. Bannister said to me, he says, how well do you know, Jack? And I said, a long time, all my life, he said. This is the way he said about it. He said, Tom, what do you think about Jack? Jack ever talk about me much? And I said, not that I know of. He calls you chief. And I think that stemmed from the fact that he was assistant chief of police or something. And uh, Jack said he got a dirty break for carrying a weapon or something. Uh, that is what he got suspended for or something. So he said, Tom, you hang around with Jack a lot. Why don't you keep your eyes open and your ears open? That's what he said. And I said, all right. I was impressed by Bannister and the fact that he and I, the fact that he had an FBI certificate from the National Academy. So he said, these are my ordination certificates. Uh, they are from two separate churches. One is religion, applying the use of metaphysics, and the other is Orthodox Christianity. This is not the same church you give reference to as Mr. Martin. They are not the same. He said, keep your eyes and ears open. So one night I was supposed to meet Jack about six o'clock, and this is what stands out in my mind. Jack stood over at the post office licking a stamp. It took him all night to lick a stamp. He would almost, he would walk almost anywhere. Really, he would. He would walk, walk from that office 
to Claiborne Towers. He had business up in Claiborne Towers and all. He was licking a stamp and looking across the street. So we walked across that street. I was watching him. At that time, I have my post office box. You can check it. I think it was at the time. At the, that time, I have my post office box. So Jack went across the street and talked to some man in the bar. And that seemed to be quite, and he seemed to be quite friends with. And they stood out and then a car pulled up and Jack got up in the car and sat in the front of Bannister's office for a while. And finally Jack left. Then one day I told Jack all the trouble I was into. And I said, boy, I'm going to have to leave this town and go somewhere. I said, and I was impressed by a sermon I had heard from J.D. Gray, the pastor of the First Baptist Church here. I had contacted the Baptist uh, Theological Seminary out there about admission to college study for the ministry. I told Jack about this, and at the time, Jack lived at a little one-room place off Esplanade, and all he had was one room. His wife and they had a little baby boy, um, and when I lost faith in Jack, his wife was working and he was not. And she would argue with him on several occasions, and he brought money. I have forgotten, but it was used to depress me. So, uh, but it used to depress me. So I said, Jack, I'm going to attend the seminary, become a minister. And I got something and not having a high school education. I thought this was the thing to do. So Jack said, kid, I would have you ordained in a matter of minutes. And I said, are you kidding? He said, yes. So I said, what do I do? He said, man, you got to get into Catholic church. This is the only, the only, uh, the other is a lot of baloney. And I said, if you believe in God, what's the difference? I am not right now, you know, he said, what well, kind of I'm telling you, I can get you in. Then he reached in. What do you call these things that stand up? A chest robe, a cedar drawer or something. You put clothes on a wardrobe. Well, he reached in and he pulled out this, what you call a rabbi. It's very similar to this thing. Uh, well, it had blue, red, green, or yellow underneath it, signifying, he said, a bishop of the faith. He showed me impressive letters from that church, letters that he had wrote. He said, now, if you want to do something, I can take care of it for you. To me, that was great. As long as I became a minister. So he got me my ordination, which I will have for you in a few days. In the meantime, he gives me a letter with all this fancy stuff on it, signed that I was a minister. In the meantime, I went down to South Rampart Street and I contacted a Jewish guy who had a building. It was empty. It was next to a clothing store. I contacted him. I said, sir, you're not using the building and I'm going to open up a mission in it for men to go to. Then I figured it out. I would uh, call all the hotels and all the food left over. I would get it and give these men. I wouldn't have to buy no food. So some bread company would give me the old bread. So the guy agreed to it. And I said, after I get the church going and people start coming in, I will have a church. And so no use let this building going to waste. So I told the man I didn't want to take up an offering. If they wanted to give it, fine, but he couldn't count on me right away. So the guy agreed to it. Well, I had a sign company, which I doubt to this day had ever been paid, uh, to put this was some kind of mission order. Jack told me uh, what to put, so I put UCMF, United Catholic Mission Fathers, uh, is what it stood for. This was a mission and came through a guy named Earl Stanley James, if I am not mistaken. I have it on paper. Well, he gave me this sign and I called Jack and said, beautiful kid, but something he wanted me to do. I don't know what he wanted me to do, but something, but I didn't want to do it. I said, no. And Jack said, if you get any mail here, I will uh, be back to pick it up. Well, I received a letter, had a bunch of stamps on it and a big seal, special delivery from this uh, apolistic, apolitistic church with the actual ordination and everything in there. Now, I never wrote th the people, but Jack must have used my name because the letter came back, Reverend Brother Beckham. I told Jack I did not want to use the word reverend as I thought that ridiculous. So he said, well, try brother after it if you want. I said, well, I will use brother. So he agreed. And when the papers come back, they were dated October 23rd, I think of 1962. I know that is the date on the ordination papers. Uh, and Jack came down and said, did I get any mail? And I said, yes, you got a, I got a letter. I didn't um, want to show him the ordination papers because he is mad at me and he will take them and rip them up. Well, this place had an upstairs inside the building. And I said, just a second, I have them hid. So I just, so Jack stood around fooling around and stuff and I got the papers, but I didn't give him the ordination. I gave Jack the letter as if the person who wrote, as if I had wrote them because he wrote about stuff I never even knew existed about the church. I did not know their orders, their doctrine of the church. So I gave Jack the letter and said, let me keep this. I said, why? What is that? And he said, I have to write them back. If you write them back, you will fumble it all up. 
So I said, all right. And he said, he didn't send you anything else. And I said, no. Then I said, can I keep the envelope? He let me keep the envelope. So then about three or four days later, I received another letter from the church in Kentucky. And he wrote as if I had wrote him telling me that he thanked me for my admission to the order of St. John, which it was called. And that we would, you know, all this stuff or on ordination or something like that. That letter, I didn't tell him. I just kept it. Didn't say nothing about it. Well, Jack come by and said, uh, did we get any more mail? I said, nope. He said, you're lying. I said, Jack, tell me. No money there. People would come in and I felt like a fool when somebody would say, can you help me with a quarter, nickel or dime? Boy, that was a poor neighborhood. So I had some raffle tickets made. Every other church was using it. I called the city. I said, it is, is it legal to have raffle tickets? And they said, nope. Every church is doing it. So what happens? I get these raffle tickets. I walk down one place after I get these tickets, walk to one place. Tickets weren't even paid for. Bought them on credit. I walked to one place, which was a finance company, and said, I would like to sell some raffle tickets. And the guy said, okay. He bought a quarter ticket, and he said, um, will you sign the receipt? And I said, yes. I didn't have nothing to worry about. The same day when I got the members of the special squad, <clears throat> they called themselves. Police department was waiting there to arrest me. For what they call operating a lottery. I had 20. I said, you want the quarterback? I even said, here's the stub and here's the quarter to give back to the man. But they grabbed me and shoved me in a car. How were you dressed while you were doing that? In the Roman collar. No, not the Roman collar. There's a difference. Uh, but were you in a priest's outfit? There's no such thing as a priest's outfit. I was wearing a rabbi. If there was no such thing as a priest's outfit, suppose you describe what you were wearing. This is a rabbi that had a, I don't remember if it was a two inch or three inch, something like that. It was not a Roman half inch split, then two inches. Then it goes on to Methodist or Episcopal, about four inches, different type of rabbis made. But I was wearing it and he grabbed me. What else were you wearing? That's it. Just the collar. Yes, the collar and my coat. What color coat? Black. So he come in and I was walking down the street and I saw them. I forget which way I was coming from. Well, they said they were from the special squad. And while I was walking to the door, somebody grabbed me by the arm, jerked me and then threw me up against the glass. And he said, uh, what's the matter? I thought maybe there were drunks down there. And the guy said, you know what's happening here? And I said, what are you talking about? And he said, open the car door operating a lottery, not even a ministry. And I said, what do you mean not a ministry? I can prove it. And he said, you can prove you're a minister. Then, okay, let's go. And he got me by the back of the neck and he said, let's prove it. I said, call city hall. It's registered in the conveyance office, which it was. I took it down there and filed it and it's filed to this day. And I was trying to tell him what the, what book it was registered in. And he said, you are lying. And he takes me and puts me in the back of the car. Then he said, the guy in the front, they looked like young kids. Uh, the guy in front said, uh, did you handcuff him? And he said, no, he won't give us any. What's the matter? You won't at least listen? I said, I am a minister. He said, operating a lottery. I said, buddy, I sold a quarter ticket. I still got the, still got the stub and I reached in my pocket and he grabbed me and grabbed the stub in the quarter. He said, and I said, oh man, someone see me. This is going to be great. See me going down with a collar on. This is perfect. A minister. That's great. I said, can I take my, take off my collar? So he grabbed me and he pushed me to the front seat. And this guy pulled over by the curb and put my hands behind me and, and handcuffed me and said, look, this is going to look funny. A minister going in. It looks bad. And he said, shut up. And he took me to the first district and he took me in and he said, stand up there, Rev. That's the way he said it up against the wall. There was a bunch of people up there. So I said, I can make a phone call. And this guy said, look, you shut your mouth because I come over this counter at you. So I shut up. I waited. And then the guy said, bring him up here. And he had a form and he said, give me your wallet and all your stuff. I gave it to him. And he said, boy, if this ain't one for the book and I keep telling him over and over. And he said, you will have just due time. Uh, you will have due time. So what I'm going to do. So I said, can I make one phone call, please? He said, yes. When we get finished. And he took my money and took their beginning, the man for a nickel out of my money to make the phone call. And he gave me a nickel. So I made a phone call. Who did I call? I think it was Mr. Delery or somebody. Well, they had a judge to call and the judge said, well, I can't do nothing for him. They're holding him for investigation. They can't get me out on investigation or something. So they threw me in jail and I lay there and I was sick. I kept asking the guy, when am I going to eat? And he said, never mind when you're going to eat. I said, man, please, will you get me something? I was so depressed. I thought I told him I was ordained and they wouldn't believe it. Nothing. They wouldn't do nothing. Then when I found out an attorney could get me out, I didn't know what to do. So I tried to commit suicide in jail. Then they took me to the hospital, and that is the last I ever heard of it. 
Did you ever go to the New Orleans airport on Sundays? Did you ever have occasion to go out there? No. Do you recall when they sent you to Southeast Louisiana Hospital in Manville? Do you recall when you went over there? No. If I suggested the date around February 1963, would that sound like it might be possible or reasonable? It might be. Do you recall what doctor treated you over there? I don't think there was really, uh, there was any really. They put you on this deal like a room. They watch you and give you medicine and stuff. Did you voluntarily go into the hospital? Let me tell you how this happened. Uh, this deal came up on this Halpern thing. Are you familiar with this? Uh, the one across the river that you all called and reported me on? We weren't in office then. No, but recently you all did, and that's what brought them down on me. Anyway, remember reading in the paper this Halpern thing came up. Well, they were called a few days ago to tell them I was in town, and what were they going to do against me? And they were called from an office. They said, my brother had worked for Halpern in West Wego, in the West Side Shopping Center. So Sonny tells me, see, I went away for the National Guards after that, then I got out. Anyway, Sonny says uh, to me after I got out, says, why don't you do something? Uh, I don't remember what time of year this was, but... Can you check on that too? Can you check in into and tell me what Sonny says? Why don't you go to work for Halpern? I says, I don't want to go work for Halpern or nobody, you know, because I run around. So, uh, so he said, oh, come on, you got to do something. The juror then asks, were you ever in the civil air patrol? No. What year was it you joined the national guard? I don't know about what year. I don't remember. Can you, is, is the selective fucking memory driving you people crazy yet? How many witnesses in a row are we going to have with this fucking selective memory? I don't remember. Anyway, my brother worked for Halpern and he said, come on. So I went to work for Halpern's and they put me on a training program, you know, to learn fabrics. Uh, they sell fabrics and stuff. And Sonny took me around and showed me this such and such fabric. I act like I knew what I was doing, but I didn't. Anyway, it was uh, three days during that time that shopping center and Mr. Halpern said, I'm going to send you over as a management trainee to the Lakeside store. They have another store run by a guy named Chaplin, I think. Uh, but it's in the meantime, when I was there at my brother's store, I noticed a woman who would come in and she would say, like you were buying material and these women have a quota to make during the day and anything over that they got a salary and commission. So they come in and maybe there would be this much left on a bolt. They would think uh, nothing of it. And the woman would say, here, hon, here's a little left over, so roll it up. Uh, but what I didn't know was that Mr. Halpern charged this stuff to Sonny Retail. He would charge 100 yards of material to Sonny at 298 a yard. He would charge it off to him, $298. So it was charged out to him accordingly, and Sonny really worked, and he would go out and sell the stuff for drapes, and he would run over when they couldn't send somebody for delivery. He would go over and pick it up. So I went to work for the Southside store. I was the last uh, to get in the morning and the first to leave in the evening. So Sonny and this guy Chaplin were going to open a store selling fabrics, but they didn't have enough money. So they changed their mind and said they were going to open up a baby goods store. Uh, is there a Shushan Brothers or something like that? Well, they got a stuff on credit. I don't even know if they paid them yet. Uh, I think they came out and picked up the stuff. So Shushan let them have stuff on credit. So then Mr. Halpern called Sonny in the store and said, Sonny, now I wasn't at Halpern's store, not even a week. I didn't even have nothing to do with the money. If the woman would say, oh my Lord, I'm short 32 or 37 cents. I would say, put your money in your bag here is 32 or 37 cents. Give your money to Mr. Chaplin. So after Sonny quit them a week later, we are short of merchandise. Mr. Halpern told Sonny, and unless you come back here and go to work and help straighten this out, I'm going to have to have you arrested. Sonny laughed at him. Sure enough, he arrested him. So I went to jail to see my brother. I want to see him. I am more likely to steal something than my brother. So I go over there and I said, I see Sonny. And he said, Tommy, you better get out of here. They're going to arrest you too. I said, arrest me for what? And he said, they got you into this too. How old is Sonny? 15 months older than me. He said, Tommy, I'm telling you, they're going to arrest you too. So I run out of there. I get in a car and I just go. I said, oh no, they're looking for me too. So police came out to the house for this Halpern deal and they arrest me. Then they go into court and Halpern drops this deal down that he purchased $12,000 against me and 12000 against my brother. He didn't say merchandise or dollars. So anyway, the district attorney told my mother that Mr. Gill was handling this at the time. So he said, there is nothing to worry about. Time passed. They never did nothing. It never went to trial. 
Finally, the attorney said, it worried me. I was sick. I think I was going to jail. And then Mr. Gill and mother got together and said, send him to Mandeville, you see. He said, there's nothing to it. They have dances. You go out there. So I went out there and they put me in this hospital and I go out of the hospital and that is the last I ever heard of it. Now they are bringing it up again since I've been brought back here. All right. So let's just take a fucking minute and analyze exactly what the fuck Mr. Beckham is talking about. Okay. So just to revisit everything relevant, seemingly going back to 1960, where in 1960, he makes the acquaintance of David Ferry and uh, Jack Martin and Guy Bannister. And obviously, since he's involved in the assassination planning up until November 63, you can say with certainty he had a three and a half to four year, almost a four year relationship with these people by the time of the assassination. Okay. What is he also saying? He's also saying that in the middle of 1962, before he the assassination, he got his um, ordination to be a minister, right? But he got it from Jack Martin, and Jack Martin's a fucking fraud and, and, a, and a, a faker, and he got busted coming up with fake college degrees and fake ministry stuff, and so all of this shit is fake, right? So why is it that a 17-year-old kid back in 1960s hanging out with Jack Martin, who's a fucking total CIA spook fucking fraud back alley abortionist, um, who was at the time shilling uh, fake colleges and um, fake ministerial stuff. Then why would they need fake ministers and all this stuff and, and fake papers that could then be registered with a city for tax deduction, right? Because all of these goddamn one-man churches were nothing more than CIA fucking money laundering operations and tax avoidance operations. That's it. So Thomas Beckham at the age of 17 was doing this for the CIA. Freaky, huh? Um, he's probably 18, 19 by the time he gets his, um, by the time, let me see, by 62, when he gets his ordination, he's an adult, right? So he's 18 or 19 by the time he gets his ordination in 62. So yeah, he's clearly working with the fucking CIA, just doing money laundering shit. And then he goes out to, then he claims to not know Fred Lee Chrisman until he goes out to Omaha after the assassination in 64, but that's complete bullshit. Uh, he will end up contradicting himself when he makes those statements, uh, to the House Committee on Assassinations, which I'm getting anxious to get to because of all the fucking lies he's telling here. But it's, it should be obvious by what he is admitting that the people he was surrounding himself with were pure CIA spooks, 100% pure CIA spooks, and that he was doing CIA stuff at a very fucking young age, right? Very young age. And since he's from Omaha and ended up back in Omaha, there must be his connection to the CIA that got him involved in all this stuff as a juvenile must be in Nebraska somewhere. Interesting stuff. Nothing nothing about Carrie Thornley thus far. Uh, they cannot bring up any of that against you. Yes, but as soon as you all let me go, yes, but the law is that you cannot be served again. As a matter of fact, I have had someone come to me and wanted to serve you with civil subpoena, and I told him you cannot be served because of the time. Yes, but as soon as I leave, they can uh, get me for a felony. It's going to happen. How long were you in Mandeville? I don't know. Uh, I don't have a vague idea. I really don't. They moved me from one place. They took me from one place. They had opened up and I said to myself, I'm sure I'm not crazy. But the next thing I know, they had me in locked quarters. How did you finally get out? I told them I wanted out. And they said, wait a minute, you can't get out right now. So some guy was running around there and he said, you can get out. So they opened the door and let guys go to church and they, and this guy left and I got out. <laughs> Do you recall which doctor treated you or anything? No. Anyway, they finally gave me the release to let me out. That is everything up to that date. And I moved away and I said, I don't want to ever see this town or nothing. Did you ever meet Grady Durham? He had a daughter, a tall, skinny daughter. Did you ever meet a person by the name of Joseph Moore? Now he's getting into the Bolton Ford stuff. Sounds familiar, but I don't know. How about William Dalzell? I don't know unless I see him. That's a blatant lie. How many times uh, have you been to Dallas, Mr. Beckham? One time in my life. What month and year? I don't know the month and year. I know it was in 66. How long were you there? In Dallas? Yes. Overnight. We stayed at the Diplomat. Were you ever there in 63? No, I wasn't. Wasn't it the executive house? I don't know what they call it. It was the executive something, motel or house or motor lodge or something like that. But you say you were never in Dallas in 1963. No, I wasn't. Not in 63. 
This church that you belonged to, was that the old Orthodox Catholic Church of North America? Now? No, the uh, church that you did belong to was that the old Orthodox Catholic Church of North America. I think it had uh, apoplectic or apolesteric or something to it. Uh, never mind about that. I don't know if uh, that is the exact wording of the church. I don't. Maybe this is not the exact wording, but is this the old Orthodox Catholic Church of North America? I can't answer you. Well, suppose you tell me the name of the church you belong to. I got the papers at home. I can show you the papers, but I don't have them with me. See, once again, he's deflecting. He should be able to give him a simple answer of the name of the church he belongs to, but he can't. But he's got the papers at home, right? So he's deflecting by not giving an answer. This is all CIA anti-interrogation training. Well, tell me what you recall that is on the paper. Let me see if I can recall what is on the paper. I don't know. Uh, it says that I am uh, an ordained priest within the Holy Apollotic or something like that. He keeps changing how he's pronouncing that word. Um, are you trying to tell me you don't know what church you are a priest in? No, because I wasn't even interested in that. I never even messed with it. Were you wearing the habit? At the time, yes. While you were wearing the habit, what church did you think you belonged to? That's a good question. Ask Mr. Martin. I don't know myself. So this guy's a fucking preacher claiming to have been a preacher back in the summer of 1962 onward till after he gets arrested and all this stuff. But he doesn't fucking know the name of the church that he was a member of. But ask Mr. Martin, because Mr. Martin got him the fake paperwork, right? This is all fakery. This is all bullshit CIA fakery. <clears throat> That's a good question. Ask Mr. Martin. I don't know myself. I'm asking you. I don't know. Were you aware that was the same church in which David Ferry was a priest? No, not until a news service. That's what I said, not until a news service. Then after I read your article, I figured that you and Mr. Martin were working together and that you set up a frame. I'm not interested in what you figured. Your answer is no. Is that correct? <clears throat> which was it? Which part? Will you read it back? Are you aware that was the same church in which David Ferry was a priest? I know now. The news service. You know now. You did not know it then. No. How were you, uh, were you ordained in any way? How do you mean? God ordains. Man doesn't ordain. I received the papers. We don't understand things like that. Will you explain? Were you ordained by any men? Can I explain it? No, just answer it. I can't answer it that way. Then answer the best way you can, but cut it down to five minutes. According to Christianity and the National Council of Christian Churches, ordination is exposed by God, the only person that can ordain. Certain churches set up councils for ordination or licensing of ministers. Some states recognize only ordination ministers to perform marriages or preach funerals. Others who are licensed are not allowed. They are to act more or less as a deacon. That's one step to work up to ordination. I received papers stating that I was ordained. Now, if that constitutes ordination, I was ordained. I don't think it does. <laughs> Who handed you the papers? They were not handed to me. They were mailed to me. How did you get them in your hand? Through the mailman. All right, you got them through the mailman. What did these papers say? Did they say you were a priest? Yes. How much did they cost you? If you total up what I gave Martin all along, I don't know. I see now what they cost me. You do not recall how much they cost you? They didn't cost me. Have you ever heard of Archbishop Archbishop Christopher Maria? Is that a ship or a person? <laughs> That's hilarious. Uh, just answer me without being cute. I don't know. Have you ever heard of Bishop Hyde? Sounds familiar, but I don't know. How about Bishop Stanley? No. Could that be Earl Stanley James or Stanley Earl James, something like that, if I'm not mistaken? Have you ever heard of Bishop James of Canada? Yes. Where did you know him from? I don't know him. That's the guy whose signature is on the papers. Is that where you heard from him? Yes, his signature is on the papers. Are you aware that he is a friend of David Ferry? I am aware he was a friend of Jack Martin. Are you, a friend, are you aware that he was a friend of David Ferry? No, I don't know if he knows David Ferry. Have you ever heard the 20th Century Reformation Church, Dr. McIntyre's church? No, Carl McIntyre, I have heard over and over. Every newsman has been asking me. Have you ever heard of him independently on, of the newsmen? What do you mean independently? 
until the newsman asked you, had you ever heard of him? I can't answer that because I don't know. It is a familiar sounding name. Have you ever heard of a member of that church named Eugene Bradley? I don't think so. Have you ever had occasion to make a phone call to Van Nuys, California? Oh, yes, on several occasions. Okay, so for my guys in the research group, um, let's start picking this apart. So we obviously have connections here between Edgar Eugene Bradley and this church and a Carl McIntyre who's in Los Angeles and the guy who signed Beckham's papers who is uh, Bishop James of Canada, possibly an Earl Stanley James. Um, and Bishop Hyde is the bishop who was involved in David Ferry, who I'm convinced was involved in a, the, the, the child trafficking or scheme, the organization that was going on, using these churches as a cover. So let's, um, let's see if we can't start to kind of congeal these relationships into what the fuck was actually going on. Uh, no, I don't know if he knows David Ferry. Have you ever heard of the... 20th century reformation church dr mcintyre's church no carl mcintyre i've heard over and over every newsman has been asking me have you ever heard of him independently of the newsmen what do you mean independently until the newsman asked you have you ever heard of him i can't answer that because i don't know it's a familiar sounding name have you ever heard of the member of the church named eugene bradley i don't think so have you ever had occasion to make a phone call to van nuys california oh yes on several occasions who were you calling in Van Nuys, California? I say several occasions. I shouldn't say it that way. Dr. Frank E. Strange, or S-T-R-A-N-G-E-S, -E Stranges. Anybody else in Van Nuys? Pardon? Did you ever call anybody in Van Nuys? Nobody. What kind of doctor is Frank E. Stranges? Dr. Frank E. Stranges is a member of the National Investigation Committee of Unidentified Flying Objects. He is also the author of several books. He owns a DPS, which is a doctor of psychology and a PhD. All right. So Frank E. Strangest kind of reminds me of Frank Sturgis. Hmm. Kind of similar there. I wonder if Frank Sturgis ever had any connection to the National Investigation Committee on Unidentified Flying Objects. It's fucking hilarious. And do you hold a PhD? I hold a PhD in criminology, which is awarded. Uh, what university did you obtain a PhD from? Well, I have one from Brankenridge Forest, which is in England, uh, which I was awarded. Fake degree, by the way. How long did you attend that college? I stated it was an award. Uh, most PhDs are granted to you in recognition as an award. I would say that there are only about seven colleges in the U.S. that grant doctor's degrees. Why did they give you a PhD? This was awarded to me. It's an award. Uh, somebody will probably give you an award before it's over with, a PhD. Why did they give you this award? I knew Dr. Chrisman, and Dr. Chrisman got it for me. I've got several awards. Dr. Chrisman got it for you. Yes, sir. Okay, so if we can't tell, um, it seems as though Beckham is in the middle of this fucking um, relationship between Chrisman and Jack Martin, and both of them are hawking fake fucking degrees. Interesting stuff. <clears throat> Why does the CIA need to fucking hawk fake degrees? Who knows? Dr. Chrisman got it for you. Yes, sir. Do you know where he got his PhD? No, sir. He attended the University of Washington in another college. He's got a secondary teaching certificate. You can check on it. Who introduced you to Dr. Chrisman? I was in Washington. He was the head of the American Association of Parapsychologists, and he was in Washington. I mean, Washington State. I have a card somewhere. No, I don't. Anyway, one of them uh, associations, and we went into business uh, together known as the Professional Research Bureau, Inc., which was in Olympia. It was in the Capitol building. What year was this? It was about two and a half years ago. Uh, you can check with the corporation, and you will know for sure. I'm not certain of the date. Uh, go ahead. What? How long were you in business together? I don't know for sure. About two years. What kind of services did you perform? Well, Professional Research Bureau was more or less a counseling business. It was set out to be with the view of also doing research in the field of, shall we say, parapsychology, metaphysics, ontology, etc. In what areas did you counsel people? No, not counsel. You're wrong. You're putting words in my mouth. What we did was, why don't you just tell me then? We had more or less liaison public relations agency, but we incorporated other things like the National Institute of Criminology, which was a nonprofit domestic corporation in the state of Nebraska, the American Association of Parapsychologists or something to that effect, that name. Did you ever use the title of Doctor of Divinity after your name? I have a doctor of, I do have a doctor of divinity, right. 
what school you are attending to obtain that. You are wrong there. Gentlemen, the highest degree you can get is a Master of Divinity, which is the MDIV, or the Masters of Theology. The only other degree granted to a minister, which is granted in a more or less honorary capacity, is a Doctor of Divinity. You don't go to school, you don't go to no school for a Doctor of Divinity. There is no school that teaches that. The highest is a Masters of Divinity. The rest is a DD. It was granted by the National Association that I have a DD. The American Ecumenical Council granted me a Doctor of Divinity. Okay, so this motherfucker is a fake doctor. He is a fake priest. Uh, he is a fake psychologist. All of his degrees are fake that he got from fucking Fred Lee Chrisman and he got from uh, Jack Martin. And he's a complete fucking fraud who works for the goddamn CIA. You know, I'm starting to kind of figure, I've been trying to figure for years, why does the CIA need these idiots, right? I think it all has to do with money raising and money laundering. And that's it. These are, these are fucking, these people are like not top level spies. These people are like useful idiots who can go open a bank account for them and stuff like that. Like, that's kind of what I'm gathering. But that's going to do it for today. We're going to pick this up tomorrow. We're on page 36 uh, out of 162. So we're going to be on this all week. And um, yeah, some interesting stuff. Interesting stuff. <clears throat> but um, yeah, so um, please, if you haven't bought the book yet, please go to Amazon, buy the book. I'm broke as fuck. Need some money. Money comes from selling books. So please go buy the book. Uh, if you need my notes or any of that stuff, you can access my notes, about 630 pages of them. Got multiple books worth of notes. Uh, and you can get that on buymeacoffee.com slash JFK book. So, uh, that's going to do it for today. Tune in tomorrow and we will be back where we will continue with this grand jury deposition of, uh, Thomas Beckham till then. Thank you. <laughs>